With the arrival of the winter update from Red Barrels, it's time to jump back into the Outlast trials once again. Previously, we looked at the program Geister Halloween update and the new lore documents that came with it. We also looked at the brand new reagent ending too. If you want to check that video out first, then by all means do. The link is down in the description. There were a lot of juicy details in that one. I also have another video on season one of Trials. So if you're not up to date on what's going on in the Outlast Trials and have been living under a rock for the past year, then that is a great place to start. Anyway, on to this update. The Winter Kills Coldest Season update introduced something called the Cold Snap. Essentially, inside the trial environments, the facility will be blasted with super cold air and you have a limited time to get to a safe hiding spot before you freeze to death. After that, you can continue on as normal. Now, there is a lore reason behind this, which we'll get into soon. The update also came with 14 new documents to find, which were of course scattered around the trials. I think that's everything in terms of an intro, so before we begin, please note that there will be spoilers in this video for the Outlast Trials. Let's begin. Alright, so let's dive into storyline number 18, Charisma. As we know, when it came to prime assets such as Sergeant Leland Coyle and Phyllis Futterman, Mother Gooseberry, one thing that was noted was their abundance of charisma. A bunch of documents give us a better understanding of this attribute and why it's so sought after when it comes to the prime assets. The first document takes us to the point way before the trials begin. They were in the planning stages. Easterman journals that the way to the Signala facility is a rough road, enough to cause someone injury whilst travelling there by vehicle. Easterman sits in the massive Signala warehouse that he notes could house an entire army. Electricity and water will be a difficult but achievable task. He talks of them needing an architect in order to design the facility's trial environments, and from previous documents this is revealed to have been a man named Moses Scarfiotti, a man who came recommended by the director of the CIA's MK Ultra program Sidney Gottlieb, a man nicknamed the Poisoner-in-Chief. Easterman writes that the Collections Department was at work as well, researching potential subjects. We also know from previous documents that one particular employee working for the Collections Department at the time was a man named Clyde Perry. As most of you will know, Clyde Perry went on to interview Phyllis Futterman while she was incarcerated at Holmesburg Prison, and also Leland Coyle at a diner in which Clyde Perry got his ass kicked. Clyde Perry noted both of these candidates to have remarkable charisma. Easterman, even in these early days, was flush with optimism. He mentions the sun being a fountainhead of inspiration. Further on from him citing the sun as inspiration, Easterman, three days later, administered a small dose of lysergic acid to himself, a substance more commonly known as LSD, a common substance used throughout MKUltra for its mind-bending effects, its ability to give the consumer the ability to hear in colour and see sounds. What follows next in his journal are the evident ramblings of a man hopped upon psychedelic substances. He starts thinking about charisma and starts rambling about being burned by the sun, that the desert is revealing some new truth to him that he has not yet unraveled. Easterman asks his wife Irene to find his copy of the Julius Firmicus Maternus, however it was not there. Essentially, Julius Firmicus Maternus was a Roman astrologer and also a Christian. Easterman mentions Carl Jung's works, The Phallus of the Sun, he references it and says, Animo descensus per orbum solis tributur, which translates as they say that the spirit descends through the disc of the sun. What I think Easterman may be getting at here is that when he is talking about the phallus of the sun, he's talking about the sun having a phallus, that it hangs from the disc of the sun, and that its movement generates wind. It was then also thought that when the Virgin Mary fell pregnant, it was this wind that caused it. It's documented in the miracle of Pentecost that the Holy Ghost flew down in the form of a dove and impregnated the Virgin Mother with the child that would become Jesus, hence the term the Spirit descends through the disc of the sun. Anyway, Easterman is obviously a believer in God and he also seems to see the sun as the only rational God, the centre of all life, and to look at the sun would mean blindness. This could also tie into what Blake Langerman sees after he leaves the caves in Temple Gate and heads towards the church the sun burning in the sky, and a massive storm. But that's purely speculative, of course. Easterman finishes this entry with a final thought regarding charisma, that to be truly charismatic, the person must be unknowable and lethally dangerous. To look at them, much like the sun, it would make you blind. The same day, Easterman journals once more, on charismatic authority. He again dives into the Bible, specifically the Book of Corinthians. Bear in mind this is before the CIA is to fully get on board with Murkoff and Easterman's work. 
Easterman talks about how St. Paul saw charisma. In the letters that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth, Paul speaks of charisma. In the Bible, however, the form of charisma that Paul spoke of was a different type of charisma, meaning the gift of God's grace, including gifting such as prophecy and healing, whereas what Easterman is saying is centered more around modern day charisma, which is considered a more special form of authority. Anyway, Easterman mentions that he rejects the idea that charisma can only be gifted by God, as he believes in the moldable, malleable organs such as the brain, and how human beings are basically clay. He says that charisma is a product, and it can also be a weapon. On the same day, still under the effects of the LSD, Easterman writes about Wernicke. He mentions that he'd love to study him. Talking of his charisma, he speaks of it being the clearest examples of charismatic aura he's ever seen. He likens his face to that of a shaman, and believes that Wernicke believes intensely in something that Easterman thinks is impossible to put into words. Of course, this feeling of admiration for Wernicke wouldn't last long, as Easterman considered his dream therapy too invasive when it came to Project Lathe. It'll be interesting to see how this tension continues to build as the updates continue to roll out. Right, for Storyline 19, we look at a collection of documents titled Prime Assets. Pretty self-explanatory. As we already know, the prime assets we have in-game currently are Leland Coyle and Mother Gooseberry. There is a third one due to make an appearance at some point. In the last video, we found out from the XPOP classification documents that General XPOP would act under the guidance of Prime Assets. That the Prime Assets charisma would be a driving force behind that. That the General XPOP had become extremely vulnerable to charismatic sway. In December of 1955, carrying on his obsession and fixation on charisma, Easterman has a conversation with Clyde Perry, and in the minutes of this meeting they both discuss Prime Assets. Now this was before any potential Prime Assets had been identified, and Easterman is laying out the criteria for Perry's recruitment drive, if you will. Easterman says that they have enough lost and damaged men and women, who of course make up the general experimental population. He suggests that Perry read another of Young's works, After the Catastrophe, and mentions that the people with the type of charisma he's looking for are exceedingly rare and exceptionally dangerous. They are quite hard to miss. After the Catastrophe was written after World War II and was a frank assessment of Young's position on Germany and of fascism. Essentially, Young's views on Nazi Germany evolved over the course of the war as he eventually came to admire the energy of the Nazi movement, or more specifically, its leader, Adolf Hitler. In his meeting, Easterman does indeed bring up Hitler, how Carl Jung saw Hitler at a rally along with Mussolini. Jung noticed how Mussolini was popular, a strong man, but Easterman comments that you'll find one of these strong men in every room. Hitler, on the other hand, was different. Looking at him, Jung noted that Hitler was withdrawn, uncomfortable, unattractive and small, and then he got up and spoke. Jung would describe him as a psychic scarecrow. He would shout, rant and make gestures, like a man possessed. Perry misses the point again. He asks if Easterman wants him to find crazy people. Easterman corrects him. He wants him to find a rare type of person that you can put into a sane crowd and 10 minutes later you've got a mob of lunatics. Hitler had that down to a fine art. It's widely accepted that the first political leaders in world history to be considered charismatic in the sense that Easterman was referring to in his earlier journals to be Benito Mussolini and Adolf Hitler. Commenting on the fact that these types of people are rare, Perry simply replies, thank God. In August of 1955, a conversation is taking place between Easterman, Avianos, and CIA agent Jameson Lawler. They're talking about looking at data from both Mount Massive Hospital and Los Alamos, that they're working towards producing actionable agents that they can deploy in the field. They want to make thought leaders for drastic societal change to train a flock capable of committing acts of extreme taboo across many different cultures. Around 12 minutes into the conversation, the topic of discussion turns to the Battle of Dien Bien Phu. Located in French Indochina, which now of course is present day Vietnam, it is the location of a vicious battle between the French Union's Far East Expeditionary Corps and the Viet Minh's Communist Revolutionaries. The US, or the CIA, were secretly providing aid to the French Union through personnel taking part in the battle. On the other side, China and the Soviets were providing their own support to the Viet Minh. Anyway, after a long battle, the French would lose and the French government in Paris resigned. The new French Prime Minister supported withdrawal of troops from French Indochina, the 1954 Geneva Accords were signed, and the French withdrew all their forces from its colonies inside French Indochina. The reason they're talking about this is when it came to US support for the French Union, the US President at the time, President Eisenhower, did nothing. 
this, Lawler reveals, was due to a very sensitive issue. As you're aware, Trials takes place during the Cold War, a time in history that gave birth to a nuclear arms race between the US and the Soviet Union, stoking fears of nuclear war breaking out. If you want to know more about the historical setting, go and watch my Season 1 recap video, but basically the US choosing to get directly involved in Indochina would spark nuclear war between the US and the Soviet Union. Easterman then speaks of Project Lathe and how it can offer the CIA a quieter weapon so that nuclear Armageddon can be avoided. They speak about the agency already being invested in Project Lathe and they mention something called the SADM. This is referring to the US's Special Atomic Demolition Munition, a portable nuclear bomb which was designed to be used in combat but which thankfully was never used. Avianos tells Lawler about potential domestic applications in terms of using reagents but Lawler doesn't want to know. Avianos responds by saying that the communist threat is growing domestically as well as internationally. Easterman challenges Lawler's belief that the French got beaten in Indochina because of a communist uprising and once again goes back to the fact that Ho Chi Minh was one of these rare charismatic leaders. It was the belief that he gave his troops that helped them win the battle. Lawler says that he'll have trouble selling that notion of charisma to his superiors and the agency but Easterman just tells Lawler to tell his bosses that it's marketing or propaganda. Four years after this conversation took place, Easterman writes in his journal again. It seems that Easterman may now realise that he misjudged the use of charisma, that fighting fire with fire only makes it spread further. He talks about Vietnam and that killing another nation's soldiers is just that, killing a soldier. But then if you strike against yourself with a tactical side, you can destroy that whole nation. A false flag operation. He then actively looked for reagents inside Vietnam. He would condition them for self-destruction. They are already attuned to their cultural environments, and you could say that he succeeded. It's September 1959. Jameson Lawler receives a letter from A. Bradley Avianos. They speak of Murkoff's Cuban adventures. After their reagent failed to kill Castro in Cuba, judging from the letter the wrong targets were killed, the CIA weren't happy with Murkoff. Avianos attempts to put out the fire and states that none of Murkoff's reagents, or what happened in Cuba, have been linked back to Murkoff or the CIA. Avianos also says that what happened in Cuba can simply be considered just another trial, that experimentation continues out into the field. They obtain valuable information from the incident at a very low financial cost. Lawler responds. He talks about Sidney Gottlieb's anger still burning. Gottlieb's talking about taking all contract work away from Murkoff, but Lawler is strangely determined to keep Murkoff on board with the agency. He flies out to Las Vegas and promises to present some new analysis out of the CIA HQ in Langley. He says that he believes that snow may fall on Cuba. And sure enough, three days later, a conversation takes place between Lawler and Avianos. About half an hour into their meeting, Lawler brings up a couple of names. He speaks of The Beard and Ike. In terms of The Beard, he's referring to a Soviet physicist named Igor Kurchatov. This man played a central role in the Soviets' own efforts of producing nuclear weapons. He would actually die the following year. His health was declining due to a radiation exposure incident in 1949. And the Ike that Lawler is referring to is the nickname of President Eisenhower. He says the words, it's coming. He's referring to inevitable nuclear confrontation. The CIA predicted an 80% chance of nuclear war within the next five years, and the world was perilously close to disaster. Turns out that the world did come very close to destruction during the Cuban Missile Crisis after a 13-day standoff. In this conversation, Lawler and Avianos are seemingly preparing and discussing a potential nuclear winter scenario. Lawler shows Avianos maps with predicted impact sites in the aftermath. Avianos is shocked to see a bunch of numbers which actually indicate temperatures, extremely low temperatures. Lawler discusses the Gulf Stream, a strong current of warm water which influences the climate in the US and in some European countries. But Lawler notices Avianos is smiling. Avianos responds saying it's nice to see him, but really, Avianos knows why Lawler is there. He wants reagents that can be placed into cold climates and who will achieve their objectives even if they know they are going to freeze to death. Lawler says that this proposal could help in swaying Gottlieb back towards Murkoff. So the next day in a meeting with architect Moses Scarfiotti and Easterman, Scarfiotti says that what they need in terms of the cold weather trials could be built very quickly, but he's curious as to why Lawler is being so nice. Avianos thinks it's because Lawler approves of what Murkoff are doing there, but 
Moses thinks it might be something else. Easterman, meanwhile, has just been sat there humming in the corner. He says that the cold weather trials that he calls winter kills will be very fruitful. It would address a black spot in their cultural trauma, mass scale annihilation, an endless winter. This is shown through the cold snap trials in the trial environments. Murkoff are preparing reagents for a specific purpose, to infiltrate many different cultures. But that's pretty much it for analysing the new lore documents in the latest update for the Outlast Trials. If you enjoyed this video then please leave a like and subscribe to the channel to support, and leave a comment below with what you think, but for now take care, and I will see you in the next one.